Karen, when I was uh, doing my work in neuroscience, I knew what a breakthrough was. An example is in, in the cerebral cortex that professor I worked with at Johns Hopkins uh, discovered that they, were, they worked in columns and the neurons were, had these very columnic uh, 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 organization. And that, that was a radical breakthrough in understanding how the cortex works. Then I began to think about, you know, what, what are some of the commonalities that if you look across various disciplines that can be called breakthroughs? So as a mathematician, how do you look at the concept of breakthrough? It's a, a discovery that changes completely the direction of thinking in one area of mathematics. And uh, you, you asked me to actually give an example, and um, the example that I'm closest to was the use of instantons to study four-dimensional spaces. Um, so help me understand that. <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, instantons are uh, a, a construct used by physicists um, they, they uh, gauge field theory is used to uh, describe particle physics. It's part of the description of particle physics. But when f f uh, physicists were trying to understand more basically what particles were made of, um, they, started, they started looking at uh, equations for these gauge fields, uh, the, the, there aren't any particles in, in, or, or in them. The equations are more on the fields and so forth. And uh, there was something called the Yang-Mills equations. And the, um, the physicists were very interested in these. And actually, mathematicians didn't even know about them, quite mm. honestly. And um, then, uh, basically, historically speaking, what happened was is there was a very important theorem in mathematics called the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem, which actually told how to, to compute the dimension of spaces of solutions, of equations. And uh, it was discovered that this theorem would describe for the physicists quite a bit about the, the dimensions of these spaces. And uh, I, uh, when I got involved in this, um, there were a lot of questions that people were asking about these solutions. And um, I, I took one viewpoint, and in fact, the viewpoint I took uh, basically came somewhat from my work uh, in um, st studying uh, harmonic maps or minimal surface theory. And uh, I was able to say something about what happened if you had a family of such solutions, what it would limit on. And another mathematician who was actually a phys uh, actually his PhD in physics, Cliff Taubes, actually showed that the limiting solutions that I showed uh, would happen uh, always existed. And um, then, but but you see, we it wasn't going anywhere. We the physicists were very excited by this. They mm. liked that. That was fine. But uh, I, mm. I mean, so uh, I don't want to minimize the importance of this in physics. But then, a graduate student of a, a tia, a Michael Atia uh, in Oxford, I think it's Oxford anyway, was looking at this, and he looked at it, and he said, "Oh yes, we'll put this together, and um, I can." take these spaces of solutions, and I can say, uh, uh, and these solutions sit in four dimensions. So that's, 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 so, and I say something about four dimensional spaces. And this was completely amazing. Nobody thought of it. In fact, uh, uh, a physicist, uh, I mean, a mathematician, Rob Kirby, uh, who's very involved in three and four manifold topology, that is three and four space topology, was just the other day asking to me, why didn't Atiyah see this? <laughs> but it's very striking that it took uh, just a whole different piece of uh, eyesight to see it. And of course, once I, I saw the proof, I, I knew the proof. That is, it wasn't that it was, <laughs> he did something I couldn't understand. It uh -huh. was just nobody thought of doing it. Uh -huh. And it completely revolutionized the, the um, study of four-dimensional spaces. Mm. And solved some of the open problems, and uh, 
And of course, it had it, it, it took four to, the study of four dimensional spaces off in a completely different direction. And, and then it, it ended up, it developed, one studied them in higher dimensions. The physicists were interested in these higher dimensional things, and mathematicians did that. And so a whole subject of mathematics built around, was built around the idea of studying these spaces of solutions of equations that basically came from physics. So is that a characteristic then of a breakthrough that it will not only enable you to see a new way of thinking, but that subsequent work can be done and following yes. that all the way through? Yes, yes. I haven't thought through this problem. I haven't made a study of it. So I can't tell you, but there's cer certainly there must be cases where people have solved open problems and it hasn't really gone anywhere. Uh -huh. And I don't think it's completely obvious at the time where things are going. Right, right. I, I think I'm, I mention, I've mentioned this before, that uh, if we all had any idea of where things were going, we'd all be running there as fast <laughs> yeah. as possible. <laughs> right, of course. But, uh, and of course, it w life wouldn't be nearly as interesting. Yeah. When you had this breakthrough, uh, what were the subsequent steps after that that, that may have even surprised you? Well, the fact that the theory could be elaborated that is, the original theory was in a very set situation with special conditions on the four-dimensional spaces. But now, once we had, they had this tool, we had this tool, I should say, because um, we were able to develop it so that it was, uh, would apply to other types of four manifolds, and then, as I said, four-dimensional spaces. Mm -hmm. When I say manifold, I, I really mean, uh, it means a space, I mean. But the idea of studying these moduli spaces has been, uh, just became part of mathematics. Mm -hmm. And it's a tremendous part of mathematics. Uh, uh, people study gromov witten invariance and Fleur homology by studying the spaces, the behavior of, space, of these kind of spaces in two dimensions instead of four dimensions. Um, there's a whole quantum topology uh, that uses these kinds of moduli spaces to construct topological invariance. Uh, and Within quantum field theory? Well, they call them quantum invariance, but um, they're baby quantum field theory. Right. That is um, uh, topological field. They call it topological field theory or conformal field theory. Mm -hmm. It's not the full, it's not, it's a simplified uh, type of invariant that's constructed in some sort of analogy with uh, some of the computations in quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the physicist's work mm -hmm. that, that they call these quantum invariants. Mm -hmm. And do uh, physicists and mathematicians have different attitudes towards what is a breakthrough and what's not a breakthrough? Uh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> That, that's, that's because I think a lot of, uh, well, you know, I'm not sure that that's so true because the breakthroughs that I'm talking about, um, the breakthrough I'm talking about, I think was seen as a breakthrough from both points of view. The, the fact that we could study these spaces of solutions mm -hmm. and that, uh, so that became real, that was in, in some way that was the physicist's idea, but the importance in mathematics was, uh, be, uh, was, uh, recognized by the physicists too. And, um, well, and and then what, one of the other one of the other things that I, I should emph, uh, should emphasize was that um, it was very quickly realized that there was a connection with certain constructions in a completely different field of algebraic geometry, oh. and that uh, a lot of these invariants have descriptions using the the uh, instanton moduli space viewpoint and the algebraic geometric, which is v very much more abstract. For example, um, you can do algebraic geometry over fields of characteristic P, which is a very strange object and has very little to do with real life. <laughs> and so algebraic geometry is not connected. Uh, a lot of algebraic 
geometry is not really connected with uh, the kinds of spaces that, and the solution, the real solutions we're talking about. But uh, the fact that algebraic geometry and this this um, uh, geometric analysis, moduli space theory was important. Um, again, any part of mathematics that becomes too isolated tends to dry up. So in this case, the theory that we're talking about of studying these solution spaces gained a tremendous impetus from thinking about it from the point of view of another type of mathematics, which is algebraic geometry. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, I, I, I would like some of the mathematicians out there to listen to this, because I think sometimes mathematicians do get too narrow in their thinking.